Good morning. It's good to see a few smiling faces out there. I think Independence Day sent people scurrying to bodies of water to enjoy themselves. <laughs> but I just want to wish you all a happy Independence Day weekend and hope that you uh, remember the sacrifices that were made to give us this independence. And I just want to uh, welcome all of you who are watching from live stream and uh, welcome to our Sabbath school lesson for the first lesson in the new quarter of July. So let's pray before we begin. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for the privilege of opening your word and studying together. And I pray, Lord, that you would just be here and that you would open our eyes to the things you would have us learn today. For it's in Christ and we pray and ask it. Amen. The new quarterly is called In the Crucible with Christ. And so I think the first thing we need to do is talk about what is a crucible. And a crucible is anything that's used to purify something by fire. And if you think about a crucible, most people think of gold. They cook gold and they heat it at the high temperatures and then all the impurities rise to the top and they scrape them off. And the different carats of gold are determined by its purity. And the more impurities it has, it has a little bit darker color and it has a different carat. But the thing that's most interesting to me is, is what are the streets in heaven paved with? Gold. What color is it? Clear. Clear. So that goes to tell me that the gold we have here on earth is not pure. Because pure, pure gold is clear without any imperfections or impurities in it. And I always find that fascinating, is that real, true gold is clear. And here we are on earth looking for this, you know, yellow stuff that, uh, you know, we talk about all the time. And people who uh, like a lot of jewelry and collect a lot of gold and stuff like that, I say, you know, I don't know why you're doing that. That's just paving material. That's what they pave the streets with in heaven is gold. Um, but it's interesting. But I want to thank Ken for asking me to teach this particular lesson uh, because the 23rd Psalm is one of my favorite things. And I'm just uh, excited to talk about this. And I want to look at the shepherd's crook. That's the picture for this week's lesson. And I want to talk about the shepherd's crook for a minute. The shepherd's crook is done, used for many things. The end of it that's not curved is used to, like, whack a sheep on the top of the head to get its attention. Not hard. I'm not talking about, you know, beating your sheep with it. But they, that gives you a little bit of a knock to get your attention, say, hey, pay attention to what's going on here, look at this. And then the crook end is if a sheep falls into some place that's dangerous and the shepherd can't quite reach them, they just hook them and haul them up. And so the shepherd's crook's really important. The other thing we need to look at as we get into this lesson is what is a shepherd and what is a sheep? And we know that we all, like sheep, have gone astray, each one into our own way. So we're the sheep. We know that. Uh, the shepherds. There's different shepherds. There's good shepherds and there's bad shepherds. And we want to be led by the good shepherd. And the one thing that I know is that sheep are not very smart. They cannot take care of themselves. They're one of the few animals that need a shepherd. You know, a rancher uh, with a cattle ranch, he turns his ranch, his cattle out onto his ranch and just lets them forage for themselves. You can't do that with sheep. Sheep are very timid. They're afraid of everything. And they have to have peace of mind in order to grow and to prosper. And that means they can't have any pests around, like flies and things to irritate them. They have to be without hunger. They have to, be, have to feel free from danger. And so when we think about ourselves as the sheep, how do we attain all those things in our life? How do we attain that, you know, fullness of food, that peace that uh, gives us the ability to rest in Jesus? How do we do that? As we go ahead and look into Sunday's portion of the lesson, it says that as we grow older and life becomes harder and more complicated, our view of God often changes. God doesn't change, of course, but we do. And that's in relation to it. It starts out talking about children drawing pictures of God and said that all of them had hearts in them, showing that all the children understood that God is love. And so they wanted to take a look at that and say, but as we grow older, we forget to think about God as love, and we think about you know, God as protector, God as other things, but uh, it's just interesting. 
So what can we learn about a shepherd from the verses that are down below? Let's turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23, verses 3 and 4. And before we read this, I want to point out that sheep can be scattered very easily. It just takes one little thing to startle them. Um, there's a man named Philip Keller who wrote a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. And he talks about how he had a visitor come to his uh, sheep ranch one day that had a chihuahua. And the chihuahua jumped out of the car and barked one time and his sheep bolted. Because they didn't know what it was and it scared them. And so sheep scatter very easily. And Jeremiah says this, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where they have, I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So what does this tell us about the shepherd? The shepherd provides everything. He provides everything. And if, you, and if his flock gets scattered, what does he do? Gathers them. He gathers them back together. He pulls them back in to the flock. Um, the gentleman I was telling you about, he, he had another ranch that was next to his that was also a sheep ranch. And that guy was a tenant farmer, which means that he didn't own the sheep. He was just taking care of them, supposedly. And said that his sheep were always uh, ridden with parasites and uh, hungry and that his fields were not kept clean and, uh, for the sheep to grow. And said that the sheep would stand pathetically at the fence dividing his ranch from that ranch and just stare because they knew that it was better on the other side of the fence, but they had no way to get there. And that's the beauty of the good shepherd. The good shepherd will take care of those sheep and pull them into his fold and help them get over the things that have gone wrong with them. Uh, what else does the shepherd do with this flock? You said everything. Let's be specific. What does he do? He feeds them. He feeds them. He takes such good care of them, them that they have no fear. Yes, the and that's shepherd, important for a sheep. The shepherd's love removes the fear. And that's like it should be for us. God's love in our hearts, do we fear? Oh, sure we do. But God's telling us, you don't need to. I'm here. I've got this. I'll take care of you. And, uh, you know, that's the things that we can learn. Uh, it goes on. It talks about, uh, you know, he leads them beside still waters. What's the importance of still waters? Sheep can't drink from water that is rushing and fast. They can't drink from rushing water. But the m most important reason that you don't want sheep near rushing water is they're top heavy. And if the wool gets wet, if they fall in and the wool gets wet, then they turn upside down and they drown. They can't get out. And so the still water makes it so that they can drink safely without falling over and getting in trouble. Uh, sheep will also fall over sometimes in the field if they're not feeling well and ill. He tells a story one time of where uh, he had to go away for a weekend and he told, there was one sheep that kept casting, it kept falling down. And so he told his son, if you watch over the sheep for the whole weekend and make sure that she stays safe and you pick her up when she ca casts herself down, uh, you know, then I will reward you when I get back. And he did. He rewarded his son. But that sheep ended up living and giving them twin lambs just a few months later. And so by keeping that sheep alive and well and keeping it up, but that's what the, he does. He rescues the lambs. It rescues the sheep. Uh, he, the good shepherd, knows his sheep. The interesting thing about sheep is, is that they know the shepherd's voice, and sheep cannot be driven like you drive cattle. The shepherd goes in front, and he watches out for anything that might harm the sheep, and the sheep can peacefully follow the shepherd. And that's what we need to remember. We can peacefully follow our good shepherd, Jesus. We don't want to get caught in the bad shepherd's field, but we know that we have a good shepherd and he will guide us all the way and take care of us.
The Pam. Good Shepherd's goal. Go ahead, Terry. I was going to say on the issue of the fear, when it says they shall fear no more, this is not talking about the fear that you get from a legitimate um, source. Like, for instance, um, if you see a snake and you're not sure if it's a poisonous snake or not, that fear is a physiological driven fear and is a normal and healthy fear. This is talking, I believe, about the fears that we have that come from our own thoughts that mm -hmm. um, cause us to fear things that might not even be an issue sometimes, but to fear things that God will take care of for us and that so we can go through life peacefully knowing that he has us today and tomorrow and always. And that's the beauty of having a good shepherd versus a bad shepherd. And it, I like this uh, text and things in Jeremiah where it says that I will set up shepherds over them. So who are our shepherds? The shepherds of the flock of the Mansfield Seventh-day Adventist Church, who are they? And even though we don't have a pastor right now, we have shepherds. Well, I think each one of us is a shepherd uh, to kind of look over the, if you see a need in the congregation, you would be there to, to help them, to work through them. And I think uh, not just the, the elders or the pastor is shepherd. I think we're all shepherds. Okay. We can all be shepherds, but the primary shepherds of a church are the church leaders because they are responsible for the care and feeding of the flock. And the feeding, I mean by Bible study, by you know, listening to sermons, by you know, songs that are uplifting, all those things that feed our souls and things. That's the things that our shepherds are responsible for. And you're right, Peggy, in a sense we are all shepherds because we have a responsibility to our community to try to pull them into the flock. And we have a responsibility to uh, those in our flock that are in need and hurting to be there to help them and to bring ministry to them. And I think that this church does an admirable job of taking care of the flock. You know, uh, I know that from experience and I know that from, you know, watching in, in the women's legacy prayer group and seeing the way that we care about each other. It's all there for all of us. Pam. Um, Pam. Yes. Um, and while you're talking about the shepherds, I happen to think about the dogs. You know, there are dogs that that work in, on the ranches mm -hmm. that help. Yeah, sheep dogs. Got, and, yeah. and I had a, a Shetland sheep dog. And interesting about him is he never barked at anyone that came to the house, but he barked when you left. If you, if when you left and shut the door, then he barked because he didn't want you to leave the area. He wanted to keep you in. Where um, it was safe. Yeah, and he, he would watch when you left and, and he would bark because he wanted you to come back. And so I think maybe that's what, uh, the, the leaders may be the, the shepherd, but the rest of us can be the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> And that's a good story because I know my brother got a sheep dog whenever his daughter was really small and they had to give it away because it kept trying to herd her everywhere. It didn't, it wouldn't leave her alone and things because he, you know, kept trying to keep her gathered up where, you know, the, the dog wanted her to go. So yeah, that's interesting that way. Okay, let's turn to Psalms, specifically the 23rd Psalm. And it says that David wrote this psalm, and, uh, you know, David was a, a shepherd, and he understood all of these things. And so, let's, I want to take, instead of following directly the way the lesson does, I want to just go through this verse by verse, and just talk a little bit about it, uh, what the different things is. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So, who is the Lord? God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Okay. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. So the highest shepherd that there is is God himself. Any shepherd that we have in our congregation is an under-shepherd chosen by God. Now, 
are there sometimes bad shepherds that get into a flock? Yes. There, every once in a while, you will get a bad shepherd in a church, and it can cause a lot of division in the church. And so we need to be careful about the shepherds that are in our church and who is a shepherd and who is guiding and who is leading. Um, and it goes on and it says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. A sheep will not lay down unless they're at peace. Unless they're fed, they feel safe, they're not being bothered by pests and things. So green pastures. What does a shepherd do to make sure the pasture is right? Well, in real, real life, uh, not in an analogy, they remove the noxious weeds mm -hmm. that are dangerous to the sheep. But I think that also the green pasture is a place where the sheep can feed and grow mm -hmm. and mature in a safe place. And God provides that for us um, when we're trusting in him. We don't have to be worrying about the other things. Right. And we can just relax in him and then he will work in our hearts to grow us and to nurture us and bring us to the place that he would have us to be. And I think God also keeps noxious weeds and things that would harm us out of that green pasture where he feeds us. He wants to keep us safe in every way that he can. But you're right. A shepherd goes before the sheep and clears the pasture and makes sure there's nothing in there that can harm the sheep. And he also looks for other things. He looks for tracks of animals that might harm his sheep. And he, he takes very great care to make sure that his sheep can lay comfortably in that green grass and, and chew their cud and just be safe and thinking about things. Uh, and it says, beside the still waters, we already mentioned that, that it, sheep can only drink from still water. It's the only way it's safe for them to drink. Uh, verse 3 says... He, let's see, verse 3, He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The paths of righteousness. You know, God is trying to lead us along a path. And he doesn't want us looking way, way up ahead and things. He wants us to keep our eyes on him as he's guiding us along this path. And it's the same thing for the shepherd. He leads his sheep in the right path, and if they wander off, to the sides, what can happen to them? They can get hurt. They can be killed by a predator. Uh, they can get caught in a bunch of uh, bushes and things and not be able to free themselves because their wool's all caught up. You know, there's all kinds of things that can happen to a sheep if it wanders away from the shepherd and out of the path of righteousness it's leading the sheep on. I think when he's talking also about restoring of our souls, our soul is the inner part of us. that essence that makes you Pam Pam and me Terry and Dan Dan you know it um, is the essence of who we are right yes and when God is restoring our soul he's healing us I believe from sin and the damage that sin has done we're told that the only thing that we will take to heaven with us is our character and I think when he's talking there about restoring our soul he's talking about healing and perfecting our characters so that we have characters that can be taken to heaven with us. And if you think about that, that's something that we all need to work on individually, but also things that we can help each other with if we see someone struggling in an area of life. As under shepherds, under the head shepherd, we can help each other during these times to be ready. God promises that he will guide us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Um, and then it goes on and it says, Yea, the, well, I want to go back to the paths of righteousness. Um, what does it say in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes? What will happen to those who hunger and thirst after righteousness? They will be filled. Okay, so I think all of this ties together. God has promised us if we will hunger and thirst to follow him on these paths of righteousness, he promises he will fill us. Then it goes on and it talks about, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How do sheep get to the high meadows? To where it's usually the best feed? 
They follow their shepherd. They follow the shepherd, but to get to the high meadows, don't you have to go through the valleys? In the Middle East, around the area of Israel, where this would have been talking, taking place, this area was known for flash flooding in the valleys. And so if you were leading your sheep through the valley up to the high meadow to eat, and what, is the, what are the high flat plateau meadows called in Spanish? Do you know? Do you remember from earth history class way back in high school? Mesas? And what does mesa mean? It means table. So God's promising to prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. But first he's got to take you through the valley of the shadow of death. So do you think the predators know where the shepherd leads the flock? Yeah. They know. They try to scare the flock and scatter them, thinking if they can get one separated, they can get it and go after it. And so all of this is going on. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. All these things are going on. And I want to I go off on a sidetrack here real quick for a minute. Um, what does a shepherd do with a lamb that won't follow him, like, uh, you know, think of a lamb that uh, might be a little rogue and, you know, keeps trotting off on his own and going and exploring and stuff like that. What does a shepherd do with that type of a lamb? Do what? Okay, but do you know why he carries it? This might sound cruel, but he breaks its leg. And he carries it around, its shoulder, around his shoulders until it heals. Do you know why? There's a good reason for it. He wants that lamb to imprint on him. And whenever the leg, leg is healed, that lamb will follow wherever the shepherd leads. It quits going off on its own. And I want to acquaint that to some of the troubles and trials that we go through in our lives as Christians and things. And Jesus, if you think about it, he carries us. He carries us through those trials and troubles, trying to teach us to follow him closer, to stay closer to him, to be led by him, to be guided by him, all of those things to keep us safe. I, I love the picture that you see of Jesus with the lamb around his neck. And when you see it, just think of the fact that he's doing that to get the lamb, to teach the lamb to follow him and to imprint upon him. Are we imprinted upon the shepherd? Are we imprinted the way we need to be upon the shepherd? I know I'm not. I'm going to admit it that I need to follow my shepherd a whole lot closer than I do. And the rod and the staff are used to guide and to comfort the sheep, keep them safe. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Pam, before you move on, I would <laughs> like to share something that I read in one of my the study helps that I read this week. And it's talking about the fourth verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then the comment was, the shepherd, after providing for us, strengthening us, leads us in the path that will restore us to righteousness. And that path to righteousness is through the valley that feels like we are going to die. It is the valley in which self surrenders all to Jesus and is crucified, the valley which frees us from the domination of fear and selfishness. As Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I just thought that was such a beautiful analogy that... We, we have to die to self. And if we don't die to self, then we won't be saved. And Jesus is there leading us through that valley of death to self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that analogy. That's really good. Uh, Jesus guides us and he leads us through that valley, but his goal was to get us out of that valley. Right. And he up, leads up us into through it. Mm hmm. But we have to go through the valley. We can't go around the valley. 
to get to where we're going. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And we just thought, we've talked about this briefly. You know, a shepherd goes ahead of the sheep. He makes sure that the field is clear of anything that can harm the sheep. He looks it over really, really well. It takes anything out that's harmful and everything. And, and so he prepares the table. And if you think about it, is Jesus preparing a table for us? Amen. Yes, he is. It's called the table of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And is he doing it in the presence of the enemies? Yes, he's doing it despite everything Satan's throwing around and things. Jesus is still preparing a table for us. And I'm looking forward to the day that we sit down at that table. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read Ellen White's description of it, but she talks about the fact that she was shown this table in one of her visions and things. And she said the table was many miles long but that she could easily see the length of it. Can you imagine being able to see clearly somebody several miles away sitting at the same table as you? It's just hard to imagine, you know, what God has in store for us, the beauty of it, and the things that he de does to guide us that way. Um, and then he says, Thou anointest my head with oil. That one's really interesting. Um, Apparently, in the Middle East, there are a lot of pests that love to annoy sheep. And if they annoy the sheep, then the sheep can't rest. And if they can't rest, they won't eat, they won't grow, and they won't be healthy. But some of these pests, there's a, a special type of insect that likes to burrow up a sheep's nose. And it's a, it's a fly that comes out just certain times of the year. And what the shepherd does, and this, this one shepherd I was, whose book I read... He, he took tar and camphor, and there was a third thing, and I don't remember what it was. It was probably olive oil or something like that, and made a concoction and put it all over the sheep's head and, and especially around their nostrils because the flies wouldn't bother them and wouldn't get up their nose. And the fly, once the sheep had that on their head, they knew they were safe from the flies and they would rest. But if they didn't have that, they were so afraid of these flies that they would run and they would shake their heads. They would stick their heads in bushes to try to get away from them. And so... Jesus is telling us that he's anointing us to protect us. He's anointing us to heal us. And of course, in scripture, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And when we are anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit, then as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, he does protect us and um, change the way we think and the things that we choose to allow into our minds to... Um, affect us so that we are really protected by that hedge of protection through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Yes, very much so. The, the Holy Spirit, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we have nothing because we must have that in our lives to, in order for us to safely travel these paths of righteousness that we're being led on. And then it says, my cup runneth over. You know, if we're at peace and things like that and, and we're feeling really good, does our cup run over? What is the cup that runs over? It can be several things. I was going to say our cup of salvation, God's grace mm -hmm. in and through us, his blessings, his love. And they run over onto others, Right. You know, that's, that's the point. We want God to fill us to the point where we're overflowing, to where we have plenty to share with ev everyone around us, with that cup that runs over, the cup of joy, the cup of peace, the cup of, like you said, the cup of salvation. Everything that we need, it just runs over and runs out and things. And then it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So where does the path of righteousness ultimately lead us? The house of the Lord. The house of the Lord. Is that our goal, to get to the house of the Lord? Our goal is to be with him. Mm -hmm. And if that's in his house, that's where we want to be. And we all have a place in the house of the Lord, correct? Okay. Many rooms. Many rooms. And I like the way you put that. He doesn't make an individual house for us. 
he gives us a room in the royal palace. And that's even better than having a house of your own out somewhere away from the palace. Um, all of these locations and things, all these things that God's doing, when God is guiding us, it's always about him training us in righteousness. That's what it's always about, preparing us to live in heaven, like you said, perfecting our character, uh, all the things that are doing. Um, are we conscious that conscious that Jesus is trying to perfect us? Or are we too busy doing our own thing to pay attention? If we're being honest, it depends on the day. <laughs> I, like, I like the way you put that. It does depend on the day. You know, some days more than others, I'm in tune with him. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I agree with that very much, that some days... I feel more spiritual than I do others, and some days uh, doing morning devotions feels like somebody's pulling a tooth out of my head. Uh, but my mother always told me that if I will ju just start reading and read until you feel like reading if you don't feel like reading, and eventually your heart will get in tune with what you're reading, and you'll get the joy, and you'll find the presence of God in what you're doing. And I, and I like that, that, to know that even on days I don't feel like it, God is there with me and will do things. Sometimes we get stuck in a valley, don't we? And I'm talking about the valley of the shadow of death. Do we ever get stuck there? Yes, we do get stuck there. We get stuck there more often than I'd get stuck there more often than I'd like to admit and things. But, you know, that's where being each other, the shepherds with each other can help when we help each other. You know, uh, you know, my brother died of COVID and for the first few months after he died, I didn't care much about anything. I didn't care if I did my laundry. I didn't care if I washed my dishes. I didn't care if I got out of bed and things because it was a valley for me. But through the support of the church, through the support of my family, you know, you come out on the other side of it rejoicing because God has helped you through that valley of the shadow of death. The more often we make those choices that allow God to work in our life, the more we come to realize how trustworthy he is. Mm -hmm. I know that when I was younger, I really was kind of afraid of the Holy Spirit, to be <laughs> frank. I wanted the Holy Spirit, but I didn't want too much of the Holy Spirit, because I didn't want the Holy Spirit to make me weird. You know what I'm saying? Amen. <laughs> I understand exactly what you're saying. But as I have trusted God and chosen to trust him and come to realize more and more how trustworthy he is, I have come to the place in my life where I'm like, God, I can't have enough of your spirit. Give me more. Mm -hmm. You know? I want to be so full of your spirit that others see Jesus and hear Jesus in me and that they will want you too, you know, and that comes about as we choose, you know, it's a, it's a choice whether or not we decide to trust God in these difficult times in our lives, you know, and sometimes it's not an easy choice from our human perspective. But the more often we choose to trust him and the more we come to realize he is absolutely trustworthy. There is nothing that we cannot trust him with. The more we long to be filled with that spirit that will work in us to heal us and to make us more like him and then his love will shine through us more and more until God says, like he did to Enoch, come on home. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to the day whenever we see him coming in clouds and, and he tells us, come on home. Then the, it goes on in Wednesday's lesson. We went through everything real quickly, but so we're backing up and going through some of it again. Um, 
It says, what types of enemies have you had in your life? And how have you responded to those who have tried to hurt you? You know, I can honestly say I haven't had any people-type enemies in my life. Uh, yeah, sure, I've had some people that have gotten angry at me, and uh, some of my family members right now would probably like to disown me uh, because uh, they think I'm a member of a cult. But, you know, no true what I would call enemy enemies to where I felt in fear of my life. But is that going to change? Isn't an enemy anything that would take us away from God? Yes. Whether it's a human or some other thing or event in our life, that would be an enemy. Mm -hmm. So an enemy is not always a human being. And, you know, people have enemy of chronic illness, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, acute illnesses sometimes, like, like COVID. And um, I just, as I read this this week, I thought of a story I heard on Christian radio a number of years ago. And a young woman was abducted by a man and instead of responding like I would of which would be probably abject terror. <laughs> <laughs> Kicking and screaming. And <laughs> you know, she started to pray out loud for this man and started to talk with him. And he drove her around in his car for hours. And the whole time she is talking to him about God's love for him and what God wants for him until finally... This man was led to Jesus through, through this woman praying and interacting with him as a child of God who was hurting and far from his Savior, but who was still worthy of being given the message of God's love for him. And isn't that a beautiful lesson of how we should be treating our enemies is to see them as hurting children of God and asking ourselves and asking the Holy Spirit, what can I do to help this person see your love? Yes. Yes, I think I've read that story too, that, that you know, that he eventually turns her loose because of her prayers and her, her kindness to him, even though he was her kidnapper and things. All the things that this passage talks about that are provided by the shepherd, the table, the oil, the cup, um, they help remind us about what God provides, even when they're in the valley. He gives us a table. He gives us what we need to sustain our lives. He gives us the oil to protect us. And like you said, the, the Holy Spirit to watch over us, guide us, and keep us safe. Uh, and then the cup itself that's overflowing with the love of God and the joy that we can have in our lives. Uh, then it, Thursday's lesson goes on and talks about, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When goodness and mercy is following you, what does it do for your life? You know, I'd like to say that what it does for your life, goodness and mercy, when you have those in your life, it flows out onto other people. Amen. When you have goodness and mercy in your life, you're able to see God clearer and see what's going on clearer. Uh, his goodness and mercy and his guidance, like you said earlier, Terry, it prepares us to live in God's kingdom. It perfects our characters. Um, Jesus said only God is good. Mm -hmm. So if goodness is following us all the days of our life, we'll never be able to get away from God because he'll always be there. And I'm thankful for that. We can't. No matter how far we scatter as a sheep, the good shepherd knows where we are and he can rescue us and bring us back to the fold. Um, in spite of all the trials and things that we've gone through, in spite of all the things that David went through, all the things that he's certain of when he wrote this psalm, Dan, did it? five minutes? Okay, thank you. All these things that God is watching us over us with and things. So what picture you get in your mind when you imagine 
all the things that God is doing to pursue you because he loves you and he cares about you. Turn with me to John chapter 10. And we'll finish up real quick here in John chapter 10. This is the, we're talking about the good shepherd and things. So all of these things that you need to know about the good shepherd. And he says that, uh, that you have to enter by the door into the sheepfold. So who's the door to the sheepfold? Jesus says he is. Jesus said he is the door and that no one can get in except through him. So the sheep are safe in the sheepfold because the only way to get in and out is through Jesus. And can you leave the sheepfold if you want to? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, it's not once saved, always saved. If you want to walk away from Christ, you can. But will he ever walk away from you? No, never. It will never happen. Uh, it says, but he that endureth and come in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And it goes on and it goes on and talks about that going down. And it says uh, in verse 9, I am the door. And then it goes on and it says, verse 10, the thief cometh for not to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I come that they might have life and they may have it more abundantly. So if you have the good shepherd, you have abundant life. If you don't have the good shepherd, you're in big trouble. Uh, the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and he carrieth not for his sheep. Uh, like I was telling you that this uh, gentleman who wrote this book said that the neighbor's sheep were just pathetic and, and were wanting to get away from that hireling shepherd because he didn't really care about the sheep. And then as the father knoweth me, even I know the father and I lay my life down for the sheep. Jesus laid his life down for us and we are the sheep of his fold. I wish we could go on and, and talk for a lot longer, but we have a couple minutes left, and I want to close in prayer this morning. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that you are the good shepherd. We thank you so much that you care for us as your sheep. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to also be under shepherds, that we could help uh, lead and guide others to come to you, Lord because that is the goal of the shepherd, is to bring the sheep safely into the fold. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to listen to you, to follow you in paths of righteousness, and be ready for your soon return. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before I leave up here, I want to make a suggestion to you. If you've never read it, there's a book called A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller. And he has some great insights as being a shepherd himself as to things that you can look at to find out more about this psalm.
Well, good morning, church. It's good to see all your smiling faces here this morning on this 4th of July celebration weekend. So I'm going to uh, ask that we all stand as we sing our opening song of praise. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me does continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever. I know there's a crown that is waiting in yonder bright mansion for me. And soon with the saints made perfect, at home with the Lord I shall be. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever. Amen. And please take your seats. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're glad to see you here today. Good morning. Good morning. Holiday weekend. We have some guests that are in and we have some members that are out. It is just a gorgeous that we have. Sound room is telling me to do something with that. <laughs> and so we're thankful. And we're happy to see you all. We're happy for those of you who are joining us by live stream as well. We just have a few announcements on Thursday morning at 1030, July 14th. There is going to be a cooking class. And um, Antoinette's coming up because she wants to give you some instructions regarding that. On the 16th will be our fellowship meal. On the 17th, a teen Bible study. And that rounds out July and in August, we'll be looking forward to evangelism at the Richland County Fair. Um, yeah, so our cooking class is the 14th. Um, that is a Thursday morning. Um, we were trying to do things at different times to meet different people's needs and schedules. But anyway, um, this is going to be a fun class. Um, and um, you should come with an open mind to learn something new or try something new. I mean, it's kind of always, I think it's always fun to try a new recipe. I try new ones all the time. And so if you, you know, just, just come with curiosity and you get a free meal out of it because we're going to eat the things that are presented. So. Um, <laughs> yeah, if nothing else, you get a free lunch. Um, but you'll also be able to take home uh, a written booklet of the recipes, so, um, and you might want to share it with some friends, and, you know, maybe there'll be some, something, things you don't like and some things you do. <laughs> anyway, I really want to encourage you to come out just for the fun of it. This is for the ladies of the church. This is women's ministry. Um, but if you have some ch your children who are very interested in cooking, you can bring them along. Um, I do really kind of need a head count, a, a, just something to um, guide me as to how much food to have. 
So please, if you're even just thinking about it, let me or Dee or Pam know so that we have an idea how many would be attending. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Antoinette. I just want to remind the uh, saints of one thing. You know, it's good to see the number of people that are here despite the fact that it's a holiday weekend. Um, you know, this 4th of July was set up by our founding fathers as a day of uh, independence, you know, a day of uh, celebration, a day of remembrance. But we have a Heavenly Father that set up this day as a day of independence, a day to be set free, you know, a day of celebration Amen. and a day of remembrance. So I just want to remind you of that as you go through this Sabbath. And the thing is, you know, our founding fathers set up that day and it's like one day a year. Mm -hmm. But our Heavenly Father set up the day so it's like every week Amen. we can celebrate. So Amen. just keep that in mind. Amen. Uh, let's bow our heads. Thank you so much, Father, for this time together. We thank you for our speaker who has had safe travels in getting here, Pastor Bianco, as he uh, brings the word today. And uh, we thank you for those who are able to join us by way of live stream and, again, encourage them to join us uh, right here in your sanctuary at any given point in time that they're able. You're an awesome God, and we thank you for loving us and allowing us to be a part of your family. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe we have uh, the good news bus. Well, before we do that, just kind of turn around and wave to your family and friends and, and uh, just welcome each other. And now it's time for our good news bus. This is a time when the youngsters will be coming down the aisle, of course, with their hands outstretched. If you will fill those hands with greenbacks, we would certainly appreciate it as we continue to uh, take care of those things that need to be done by way of the youth education program. And I read and study about birds. And today I want to tell you about three different birds that do something a little bit different than, than other birds. Um, so uh, birds, you know, they, do you know what courtship is? Okay, um, well, it's, you know, in, in the people world, Courtship is when uh, a man and a woman um, get to liking each other and they may go on dates and do things together. Um, well, in the bird world, um, some birds will pick a mate and stay with them for life, for all their life. But a lot of birds just um, make a, find a mate for the summer, for, for one year. <clears throat> well, um, usually, which is a little odd, <laughs> uh, the female, you know, female means the lady, right? The ladybird gets to choose what man bird she's going to stay with. So the, the male birds um, have to, um, let's say, perform so that the female will want them. 
Okay, so now first I'm going to tell you about the Roadrunner. So the female Roadrunner, they li Roadrunners are birds that live out west. There, look at the screen. There's a picture of a Roadrunner. Okay, so the female Roadrunner just run, 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 run for hours. And the male that can keep up with her is the one that she chooses. So he's got to be a good runner. No, those up there. Those are road runners. They, they live out west in this country. Okay, now the next bird I'm going to tell you about is the black vulture. Uh, the black vulture is a, ver a bird that mates for life. And um, the, do you know what, you know what vultures eat? Uh, they eat anything that's dead on the road. Yeah. <laughs> they do. They eat dead stuff. Yeah, so um, sometimes, you know, our breath is matches what we eat. So do you think they have good breath? No. <laughs> no. Well, we don't think so, but here's something interesting. The males come to the female and breathe on her. <laughs> and the one who's got the stinkiest breath that she likes is the one that she chooses. Isn't that strange? Yes, that's strange. <laughs> okay. So the third bird I'm going to tell you about is the prairie chicken. Now you can see a picture of the prairie chicken. Yeah, they're pretty birds, and they like to live out in the, in the grasslands. <clears throat> now with the prairie chicken, again, the female chooses who she wants to live with. And um, the males, well, they puff out their neck, and they strut around, and they raise their tails, and they do a little dance. Wait, and they dance? Yeah, they dance. Now, the female picks out the one that she thinks dances the nicest. <laughs> Isn't that something? Okay. Um, so all of these birds kind of have to perform to get chosen, right? So, but I'm going to tell you something. We don't have to dance real pretty. We don't have to have stinky breath, and we don't have to run really fast for Jesus to choose us. There's a, there's a verse in the Bible, it's John 15, 16, and it says... You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit. So I want you to repeat this one with me because I think this is very important to know that God has, or God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you know, they choose us. They choose to love us. They choose us before we even think about choosing them. Before you even thought about loving Jesus, Jesus loved you. So, um, so I want you to kind of say this verse with me, okay? You did not choose me. Can you say that? You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you should bear fruit. Do you know what fruit he wants us to bear? Anybody got a guess? Oranges? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oranges are sweet. That's not too bad. <laughs> and those are nourishing, but that's a little bit sour, the lemon. Potatoes. <laughs> and that's not a fruit. <laughs> Limes? <laughs> Limes is pretty sour, too. Oh. Now, the fruit he wants us to bear is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. That's the fruit he wants us to. But anyway, before we even bear fruit, he's already chosen us. <laughs> so he has chosen each one of you to be his special friend, right? 
Yeah, and so that's a really good thought to think about every day, right? Because sometimes in life, people don't choose you, and you might feel neglected or rejected, but you can always remember that Jesus chose you. All right, so um, that's the end of my story today. Um, Oh, and just one more bird I thought I would tell you about, because this is a little different. <laughs> um, there's a bird called the fairy bird in Australia. Fairy. Yeah, the fairy bird in Australia. You know where Australia is? Yeah. Yeah. It's the smallest continent. Okay. That's right. Yes, and it's over there in Asia, right? Somewhere. Okay. Well. It's over there somewhere. In Australia, they have different animals and birds than we do. Anyway, they have a bird called the fairy bird. And Why is the fairy I, bird? Well, just because they're very pretty. They're very pretty birds. But you know what? The male fairy bird brings a flower to the female. Isn't that cute? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we learn from them. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Um, would somebody like to have a prayer? Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for the birds and men and purple and everyone in this town. Dear. Thank you for everybody and for choosing us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have some pictures of birds, so you can take one and to color if you'd like. Thank you so much for that wonderful good news story. And um, I guess all those, it was a reminder, actually, for all of us guys to remember to bring our brides a flower. I think that, that's what I got out of the story. <laughs> yeah, if you can't dance, bring the flower. Um, you know, this is the time that we also get to participate in worship by way of giving. And uh, the poorest of us is, is very rich um, according to the standards of the world. If you can get out and see how other folk are living um, in other countries, um, we've been blessed, each and every one of us. And the Lord um, makes sure that he sees to our needs and... Um, he makes sure that we have and what uh, is needed from one day to the next to survive. So we want to be thankful for that. And he asks that we uh, participate in giving back just a little bit of what he's given to us. So if you do that with a cheerful heart, you will continue to be blessed. So I'd like for the deacons to stand. We thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity to return to you what is rightfully yours and if you will bless it in a special way so it'll go to do what you would have it to do to further your cause and to increase the numbers in your kingdom we certainly appreciate it lord in jesus name we pray amen
we appreciate that that is what our uh, founding fathers chose as the battle hymn for the republic. You think side by side, you know, our, our country fighting for freedom, and we think of God's kingdom that is eternal when we hear that song. Thank you so very much. Uh, we will now sing a call to prayer, and then we'll all pray together. sing together. Hide me now under your wings. Cover me within your mighty hand. Find rest my soul Christ alone, know his power in quietness and trust. When the oceans rise and trumpets roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood, and I will be still and know you are God. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood, and I will be still and know you are God, and I will be still and know you are God. Let's pray together. Good morning, Father. We thank you for the wonder of this new day. We see prophecies being fulfilled, and it means that we are one day closer to eternity with you. And that gives us strength and hope for each day. And we are looking up. Dear Father, we are looking up. We praise you and proclaim your greatness this morning, and we will never forget all your benefits. You forgive all our sins. You heal all our diseases. You ransom us from death and surround us with love and tender mercies. You fill our lives with good things and renew our youth like the eagles. You are merciful and gracious, slow to get angry and full of unfailing love. And as far as the east is from the west, you have removed our rebellious acts. And for that, we bless your name. This weekend, Father, we think about the state of our nation and the meaning of freedom and the blessing of God-given rights, especially the right to freely worship you. We believe that your divine hand was upon the pilgrims and the founders of our nation and that you inspired the authors of our great constitution. We thank you for the blessing of our nation, for freeing us from the grips of tyranny to be a beacon for all nations. And Lord, we long to stay independent from tyranny, but always dependent on you, Father. Thank you so much. There are misguided ones, though, who are not grateful for your guidance and protection. They want to discard the Constitution, disavow you, and any notion of God-given rights. They want to impose tyranny and strip away our freedoms. We pray in Jesus' name, dear Father, that they will not prosper or succeed. Will you create chaos and confusion amongst them so that they attack and destroy one another instead of this great nation? Even as we pray for this nation, we know that our citizenship here is temporary and we long for our home in your kingdom. Our true home is where Jesus himself 
will welcome us and be in the very midst of us. And this is the blessed hope we have. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, as we wait, and give us your heart of compassion, for we know that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all would hear the good news of your great grace and believe and be transformed by it. Make us instruments of your grace, Lord, so that others will want to know about this wonderful hope that we have. We lift up to you today, Father, those who are suffering from illness, Betty and Andy, and those who are recovering, Nora and Art and Gary, and those who have experienced sudden loss of loved ones. And we also pray for Psalm 91 protection for those who are traveling this weekend. We pray for the shepherd that you are preparing for our church family. And last of all, but not least, bless Pastor Bianco as he expounds on the many victories that Christ has won for us on the cross. Thank you that Jesus willing, willingly sacrificed himself, that we might be saved, that we might become heirs to the kingdom of promise. May the day of his coming be soon. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again, church, and this is another time where you get a chance to participate and worship by lifting up your voices in praise. Um, there was a verse that was given during the Good News bus that I thought was pretty good. It says um, that Jesus said that you did not choose me, but I chose you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. You know, the Bible tells us that we're all predestined to be saved. It's just a matter of whether or not you choose him as he has chosen you. And um, the good news is that there is no condemnation. It says that in Luke 19.10, it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And that would be each and every one of us. So I'm so glad he came to look for me, he came to look for you. Aren't you glad for that too? Okay, I want you to remember that verse as we sing each one of our songs for a praise time today. Let's bring it out to the Lord. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to show his power and might. That's why we praise him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this king cause he gave his everything cause he gave his everything he came to live live again in us he came to be be our faithful friend he came to heal and show the lost ones his love he came to go prepare a place for us that's why we praise him that's why we sing and that's why we offer him our everything that's why we bow down and worship this king because he gave his everything because he gave his everything get to sing hallelujah 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 hallelujah
That's why we praise Him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer Him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this King. Because He gave His everything. Because He gave His everything. That's why we praise Him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer Him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this King. Because He gave His everything. Because He gave His everything. Because He gave His everything. Say amen. amen. Oh Lord, you search me. You know.
falls from my eyes and you stand before me I know you love me I know you love me Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hill, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom, everything I once held dear, I come. I belong to you, oh lead me, lead me to the cross. You were as I, tempted and tried. sin and death now you're risen everything I once held dear I count it all at cost lead me to the cross where your love poured out bring me to my knees Lord I lay I belong to you, oh lead me, lead me, lead me to the cross where your love poured out, bring me to my knees, Lord I lay me down, rid me of myself, I belong to you.
Our scripture reading today is from Colossians 2, verses 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it all away and nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Thank you for the scripture reading. The next voice you hear will be that of Pastor Rick Bianca. And we thank you so much for traveling all this way to come and bring us the message today. Let's give him a mighty amen, if you will. Are we on? We good? Good morning, everyone. I bring you uh, greetings from the Ohio Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. I am the uh, superintendent of education, and I have the privilege of being associated with this amazing school that you have on this campus. Where's Nora at? I saw her earlier. There she is. Nora and Christina are just two amazing, fantastic teachers, and we are just grateful to have them as part of our team. Uh, I need to uh, just share something real quick. Where, where's Antoinette? I'm not happy with you. All right, you have a cooking class, and then you get me all excited about hearing about it, and then she lays the bomb, bombshell. What would that bombshell be to me? Women yeah, women only? What's, what's up with that? <laughs> Seriously, like... Cooking is my, like, first love, almost. I mean, you just broke my heart, so thank you for, like, destroying everything that I felt today about that, so. But ladies, have a great time. <laughs> Seriously, you know. You don't want the good food. <laughs> oh, I don't know. You don't know me in food. I mean, you don't get this beautiful pear-like body without wanting to go places, okay? <laughs> so I'd like to just share with you Happy Independence Day. Today's the day. You know that, right? America is officially 246 years old today. Today is when the Continental Congress actually voted to separate themselves from Great Britain. So it's not on July 4th. Why we celebrate July 4th is because that's when it was written on the document. But today is the day. So we are officially 246 years old today. Now, July 4th we'll celebrate because of the of the written, of the, of the July 4th written on a document, but it wasn't signed until one month from today, just so you know that as well. August 2nd, 1776 is when all the signatures on a Declaration of Independence took place. So I just want you to a little bit to know that, okay, so you understand, but today is the day, so, and to commemorate this, I, I you know, I had a little bit of pink on, but I thought, man, it's July 4th weekend, I've got to have something, so here's what I did. I wore my Lou Gehrig socks. Now, does anybody know why that would be significant? Okay, well, Lou Gehrig had obviously Lou Gehrig's disease. He was not doing well toward the end there. And on July 4th, uh, in 1936, he went in front of Yankee Stadium and gave one of the most famous speeches of all time. Uh, so that happened on July 4th. So that's why I wore my Lou Gehrig socks today, so I could kind of be in the spirit of, of the moment a little bit, okay? So... Thank you all for uh, inviting me to be here today. I'm very excited about being here. I want to share with you some personal stuff today, but I want to share with you uh, that personal stuff because I want you to understand that I am with the, I don't ever put myself above or beyond anything else. Whenever I say, whenever I say some things, I'm literally talking to myself on this as well. Okay, I am not, I'm not a pastor. Thank you for those very kind. I'm not a pastor. I am not a pastor. Okay. <laughs> My grandmother wished more than anything in this world that I would be a pastor. I am not a pastor. I do not put myself in near that esteem. I will never be in that esteem. So pastors are on a different level. I appreciate them very much. So please, I am just Rick. 
Okay, so I appreciate that. But I want to share with you a little bit today. I'm going to move around quite a bit, so if you're uncomfortable, it's because I'm going to be standing right next to you. If you tried to fall asleep during my sermon, I got news for you. I am an educator. I know what proximity means, and whenever you start closing your eyes, I will be in your proximity. Okay, and I will stay there until those eyes come back up. Okay? I have never had a young person try to sleep in my class, and I assumed if I ever go back into the classroom, I never will either at that time either. But I want to share with you from Colossians. If you want to turn with me on Colossians 2, there's just a few things I want to share with you from the text that was read so beautifully this morning, so thank you for sharing that. But whenever we talk about this, I want to talk about our trophies. And in this world, in the United States in particular, we live in an amazing country. Ladies and gentlemen, I will never say otherwise. Do we have warts? Yes. Oh, yes, we have big, fat, hairy warts, okay? But we still live in an amazing country that has been blessed beyond measure, okay? But with that has caused us internally to kind of be reaching for the wrong things in our lives. And that's what I want to share with you a little bit today. But in Colossians 2, 13 through 15, there's a few things I want to highlight in this text. And first of all, this text is it's loaded. I mean, you could honestly spend a lot of time on these three verses. It's loaded. But it says, when you were dead in your sins, okay? That's something we have to understand, that sin causes us to be what? Dead. We are not alive in any way, shape, or form, ladies and gentlemen. And you have to understand that, that whenever we are in sin, we are dead. That is first and foremost. God then made us alive, but how? Through Christ. Jesus Christ is the single most important part of any equation. That is the only reason we are here today. We are called Christians. We're not going to get into the Seventh-day Adventist part. We are at a base level Christians. What does that mean? That means that we are followers, that we are believers, that we are lovers, that we believe that Jesus Christ did something very special over 2,000, well, not quite 2,000 years ago. It'll probably be in about 10 years. It'll be almost exactly 2,000 years. But 2,000 years ago, he didn't just die, by the way. The dying is important, but it's not the most important. The most important is clearly what? Because lots of people die. I got news for you. You're going to die. It's one of those things about humanity that really stinks. But we have this blessed hope that after death is the ultimate, which is the what? The resurrection, which was first shown to us. Well, I mean, I know that he rose a lot. I, I get all that. But Jesus came from the grave. So we are Christians. So we are made alive in Christ. He forgave us of our sins. Now, why is that important? Because our sins, we are what? Dead. Dead. Okay, that's important. He forgave us of that. So we are no longer what? Dead. We are now alive, okay? But here's what's really cool too, okay? He canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away and did what with it? He nailed it to the cross. He says, you know this? I'm not going to accept this. Bam! To the cross it goes. That is so important for us to remember here. Um, about six months ago, there was a kind of a, a euphoria, if you will, on my neck of the woods down in southwestern Ohio. If you kind of do a little backtrack, in six months around January, the Cincinnati Bengals were all the rage. Now, I got to just let you know, I am a Pittsburgh Steeler fan through and through. You don't like it, that's on you, not on me, okay? That being said, you know, when really lousy teams for decades and decades and decades do well, like the Browns and the Bengals, you know, you kind of like, hey, good for you, go little Charlie, you can do it. That's how we see our fans kind of see it, you know, because they're like that little, little boy that, come on, you can do it, okay? So in southwestern Ohio, man, the Bengals were red hot, as you know, they went on a pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing trip. Well, one morning, 
Uh, I, I coach uh, at Spring Valley Academy. I coach the junior varsity uh, basketball team. I assist uh, Pastor Ed Martone with that. And unfortunately, for half the season, we had our Sunday practices at 8 a.m. Okay. The one morning where you get to sleep in, you don't get to sleep in. So, and I live probably 20, 25 minutes away from the school. So you get up nice and early, and you get in your car, and you start driving. Well, that also provides a really interesting time of reflection. Because there's nobody else on the road, first of all. I mean, Sunday morning, that's the great thing about it. You, you're in a zone. I like to listen. I have Sirius XM, and usually on Sunday mornings, whenever I do that, I love to listen to Elvis radio. Because on Sunday mornings, for those of you that don't know, on Sunday mornings is when they play all of his gospel stuff. And Elvis's gospel stuff is off the charts. It is amazing. I mean, his influences from Mahalia Jackson and others is so evident. I mean, he, he lived and breathed that whenever he was growing up. And you can hear it in his voice. You can't get that type of passion unless you kind of like really take it in. And while I'm listening to that, I was, uh, a song came on that really just kind of got me just reflecting big time. And we're going to hear that song later whenever we, uh, as a group. But, and it's also one of my favorite songs ever. And it's the old rugged cross. And whenever you start thinking about that song, it really starts to allow you to have some self-contemplation. Because then you start thinking about, I mean, lay our trophies down. What does that mean? Does that mean that you have to, you had to be a part of a chess club or, or, or a basketball team or a softball team? And you have a trophy and you have to lay it. Is that what that means? That's not what that means, right? I hope we all understand that, right? And so then you start thinking about the words to that song and understanding what uh, was written there. It started to kind of like, I started kind of like getting kind of emotional, and I do that sometimes, and whenever I'm alone, you know, my wife goes up to bed, and I sit on my green chair downstairs, you know, I'll have the TV off, and the lights will be down, and occasionally there'll be the, the kitchen light that is adjacent to our, our, our living room, but, but usually it's kind of dark in there, and I just start reflecting on my own life. And I started thinking about what it means to lay my trophies down. And in this whole euphoria of the Bengals, I started thinking about, you know, going all in. And, and you hear that a lot from athletes. No, oh, I had to give everything that I am. You know, I, I gave up this, and I'm so proud of this, and da, da 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 And I started thinking, do I do that for God? And I started reflecting on my own life, and I started thinking about my childhood. We're going to get to that a little bit. And I started thinking more and more about what it means to lay my trophies down. You know, on that hill far away, the old rugged cross stood an emblem of suffering and shame. I think about that, and I think about that, uh, some of these pictures. We saw these really great pictures up there. But, you know, some of the ones where you see, where you see that, like, the sun set in the background, and you see the silhouette of Jesus kind of lay, standing there. Does that not get you emotional? Again, why are we here? We proclaim to be what? We proclaim to be Christians. That singular event, I know that the resurrection is so vitally important, but we had to kill him first. And notice my phrase I used there. We had to kill him first. And don't, 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 don't get all sanctimonious on me and think that you didn't have a part to play in that. I got news for you. There ain't a sinless person in this room. Amen. Okay? And we always, like to, we always like to play this weird game. Oh, well, you know, if I was back there and I heard Jesus' words for three straight years, I would not all. Okay. Peter, who the rock, who, who is the foundation of the church, right, in a lot of ways, Peter even denied. Peter! You don't think you would? Squeeze me? What you talking about, Willis? The point is, is that that emblem, that, 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 that scene, and just, you can see it up on the screen there, just imagine that scene where you have Jesus up there, and he's there, and he has said just a few little words up there, but all those words, by the way, were incredibly powerful. Incredibly powerful. He said, forgive them. 
for they don't know what they're doing. He's about to die. And he says, what? Forget that. Can you do that to somebody who's killing you? Can you like look them in the eye and say, oh, I heard it. Somebody, <coughs> by the way, there's a lady over here during Sabbath school. I uh, came in really, really super duper, 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 duper late. But somebody said, you know, like, uh, we should, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, our, our enemies and forgiving our enemies and, and kind of loving our enemies. Imagine that. Imagine looking at your enemy who, by the way, is killing you. I forgive you. Can you do that? Me? <laughs> I don't think I can. That's just me being real. I don't think I can. I'm holding on to other trophies. I want to share a few texts with you so we can talk about what, what, what idols are, okay, as we go into this. So if you want to, and I'm going to flip through these pretty quick. So if you don't, don't, don't some people are like, oh, I have my little notepad out, and they got to write down every little, there we go. It's Okay. Okay, Exodus 24. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. What does it say? You shall not make anything. Okay, Psalms 115.4. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. Are we seeing some here? 1 Corinthians 8.4. By the way, four, verse 4 is pretty popular with these. An idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. And then in Colossians 3, 5, to put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is all idolatry. Why should I care? God made us, God didn't make us automatons, right? Are you a robot? Are you a cyborg in any way, shape, or form? No, God made us what? Free willed individuals. I can make any decision. So if God made me this way, I can do whatever I want, right? You can. You most certainly can. I want to be very clear about that. God will not say to you, you can't do that. Okay? Because God says, no, I love you. You're a free willed individual. I have these things that I want to share with you. I would love it if you wanted to share that with me, but it's your decision. It's your decision. That's important. But why should I care? Well, I'll tell you why you should care. In Gethsemane, I want you to think about Gethsemane for a second. You want to talk about a scene that is gut-wrenching. I know it was made by a Catholic, and it has Catholic overtones. Forgive me. But there's a movie called The Passion of the Christ, that there's a scene there, the Gethsemane scene, that is absolutely gut-wrenching. Because it shows that Jesus was in this physical and spiritual anguish to the point of near death that he was saying to his father, dude, please, this is such a burden. This is such a weight. Please take this cup from me. What happens? Do you know what happens in Gethsemane? I'll tell you what happens. This is what God does. And Jesus says, if it's your will, God, Father, then so be it. I will take it on. Even though this has me to the point, literal point, of death. Now, if we proclaim to be Christians, which I'm going to assume there's what, about... 40, 50 people in here? If we're proclaiming to be Christians, that moment is very powerful to us. Because that was the last moment. That was the last moment where there was nothing going to stop Jesus at that moment. He gets up and he literally 
after that moment, walks through the cross, walks to Golgotha, literally, at that point. I know he gets taken before some people and a lot of just horrific things, but they were all manly things are done to him. But he was right spiritually. He was in tune completely with his father and nothing, no matter how hard they beat him, no matter how many times they spit right in his face, no matter how many times they kicked him, no matter how many times they said to him, you are not he. He, with dignity and grace and mercy, walked to the cross for you and for me. That's why it should matter. Gethsemane is part of it. Gethsemane, that, that scene in Gethsemane is so critical for us to understand as to why it is that we should care. Hung on the cross, he goes to Golgotha, he's hung on the cross with these thieves. <laughs> I'm gonna kinda share something here, I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to anyways. Whenever that movie came out in 2004, I went and saw it seven times in the theater. And almost every single time I went and saw it, I walked out in tears. It wrecked me. It was in 2004, and I was teaching at that time, and I think I was kind of, I mean, I, I trust and love Jesus, but I think I was kind of like not really sure where I was. And it just kind of gave me this, this, this non-abstract, this concrete vision of, of you know what, that was, that's so powerful and, and that means something to me. You know, because we sometimes have to, we can't understand spiritual things too well because it's, it's, it's kind of outside of our, of what we can comprehend. But I can understand physical pain. I can understand what it's like when somebody looks at you in the eye and spits at you and then walks away. I can't understand or somebody kicks at you. I can understand that. And I think that's why it's so important. Because while that spiritual aspect, we really fully can't comprehend. Because our brains, you know, we have a really wonderful brains. Okay? But it's only whenever we go, get to be perfect again that that spiritual thing that we really fully comprehend it. But that physical part is so powerful. And so I mean, I think to myself, what on earth am I doing? And every time I went and saw that movie, there was one time I went and saw it toward the end. It was like in week five <laughs> or whatever it was. I was the only one in there. I didn't care. I didn't care. That scene whenever they're on the cross and the thieves are there and they're just looking down at you and you're up there looking up at him. What am I holding on to? He was insulted, ridiculed, but he still asked his father to forgive us. Oh. And then the tomb. John 20. John 20 is exciting, people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank God for the empty tomb, right? I mean... I don't know what it would have been like to be Mary. I think she probably had like this huge, you want to talk about having a mixed up mind at that time? She literally sees this person that she loved more than anything in the world killed before her eyes. And she helps take him down and she, he's a bloody, unholy mess. But yet, you know, they, they do that and, and, and they're gently, can you imagine the scene just gently laying him down and, and trying to wrap them, trying to, trying to have some dignity to this, to this man that they loved so much. And then they pick him up and, and then they carry him into the tomb. And, they, and, then, and then because, you know, this was pretty scary stuff for the leaders there. While they're in the tomb, you know what they did? They said, okay, well, by the way, we're going to put this rock there. But we're going to make sure that nobody messes with this. So they get these seals, and it's usually like wax or something, okay? And then they have like an emblem on there, which is very specific, Okay, and that emblem, you know, obviously if it's still intact, but these guards are there, and in the morning, this tomb is wide open, empty, and the guards are like, oh, uh, um, 
<laughs> Can you imagine what they were feeling at that time? They had to be. Can you know one thing about the Romans? They didn't mess around. You did something. It's kind of like, you ever see the Queen of Hearts for, for Alice in Wonderland off at their heads? That's kind of how the Romans treated things. It wasn't like, oh, it's okay, buddy. You let Jesus go. It was only the most important thing that's happened. To no, you're good. They had to be nervous. Thank God for the empty tomb. So, what is our responsibility, ladies and gentlemen? The world is full of idols. It really is. Growing up, I grew up, and I don't know how much time, it's 12, 11. What, it, what is the Rick shut up time? 12, I'm done? I've gone too far? We can have prayer and move on. <laughs> there we go. Amen. Boom. I love you. Growing up, I, I, uh, whenever I lived with my mother, she lived in the projects. Um, and the kids in town used to call it Cardboard Palace. Uh, Rick used to get in a lot of fisticuffs over the word or phrase Cardboard Palace. Because Rick back then and Rick now were different people. Because Rick back then, you even looked at me even a certain way, and we were scrapping. And uh, I remember getting the government cheese. Anybody else here get government? No, raise your hand, because I'm not going to do that to you. But I'll tell you what, government cheese makes the best grilled cheeses ever. And if you haven't had it, that's on you, not on me, Right? Because government cheese make great grilled cheese. I also remember the milk and the eggs and the bread. I also remember the Monopoly money, a.k.a. food stamps. See, nowadays they make it so easy. They give you one of these. They give you a debit card. So you go in there and you swipe your debit card and, there's, and, and, you, and you're good. But not me. I had to, my mom would give me like pink, green, yellow, blue. I'm not kidding you. That's the actual colors of these things. If you haven't been on it, let me tell you. When you're going down to the store and you're in the same store as your friends and they're paying with greenbacks and you're pulling out Monopoly money, you feel smaller than a molecule. You don't feel any self-worth at all. But if mom tells you to go down to the store and buy something, guess what I'm doing? Going down to the store and I'm paying for it with Monopoly money. Well, what's interesting though is my mom and dad, I was, I was, I was a mistake. I was a backseat mistake. I like to joke with my wife, because my wife is almost exactly nine months older than me. I like to say that my mom and dad were celebrating my wife's birth. That's what I kind of like to say, even though they were on complete, not even anywhere near, they didn't know each other or anything like that. So I'm the only child. My mom and dad were never married, but I have siblings on my dad's side. I have siblings on my mom's side, but I'm, I'm kind of like this, this flag flapping in the wind, okay? So on my dad's side, though, there's a little bit of money. They're in the coal business. They've been in the coal business for about 80 years now. My great-grandfather uh, started coal companies. And so whenever I, did, but I, I didn't really have a relationship with my dad until I was much, much older. But my grandmother was religious. And my grandfather were absolutely religious about bringing me for the summer and, and all that stuff. But it was interesting because I lived in the projects where there was, yeah, I don't need to explain it to you. You know what the projects are, okay? If there was some sort of debauchery, it existed there, okay? It just, it, it was Sodom and Gomorrah. It really was in a lot of ways. At the end of the month, it would be really interesting. At the end of the month, you know, the mailman would come. It was always on the 28th. The mailman would come, and there'd be a swarm of people there. Why? Because that was when the welfare checks came. But on my dad's side, there was a little bit of money. So whenever I'd go there and my, it would be, you want to talk about a weird juxtaposition. My grandmother would pull up in this like 19 foot 
white Lincoln Continental. Gorgeous. I went to projects and I'd get in like, just me, because, you know, my brothers and sisters, they, they, they were with a different... I wanted that. I wanted that bad. I wanted my grandmother and grandfather's house, who even to this day is my favorite house ever. I wanted the cars. I wanted to be able to go to any store that I wanted to go to and not have to worry about the D word, decline. I wanted to be able to go to any restaurant, Antoinette, that serves men, okay? I wanted to go to any restaurant, eat whatever I wanted. They were idols for me. Whenever I went to school at Columbia Union College, which is now Washington Adventist University, my first couple years, my first year, I went as a business major because... My family's in business. I wanted, to, I wanted all that. You know, God, though, he's sick in the head sometimes. Because he, he, he looks at me and says, <laughs> you silly rabbit tricks are for kids. During this time, my grandmother makes sure that I work at Laurel Lake Camp. Laurel Lake Camp is the truest and the best and you keep things going. Which, you guys, it's Camp Mohaven, but it was Laurel Lake for us in Pennsylvania. And whenever you're working with kids... Things happen to you. It's like, man, this is kind of cool. I kind of like this. After my first year working at camp, going down to, uh, back down to Washington, well, CUC at that time, I ended up uh, looking at, a, I, I was a lifeguard, I worked at Blockbuster Video, and then I also went to a daycare. It was just down Flower Avenue, and they were hiring a fifth grade after school teacher. I'm like, man, why not? More money. <laughs> Needless to say, I went in, and well, I had to have a phone call first. Uh, I'm going to change my major. Well, you've already taken a year. Oh, uh, I know. I'm going to change my major to education. Well, that's what makes you happy. Okay, so I go in and change my major to elementary education. But, you know, are roads always straight? No, not unless you're in, like, Kansas, okay? Roads are rarely straight. My road was not straight. It went... I was out of school for a couple years. I was bartending. And one day in 1993... Uh, my cousin Jonathan went to the same high school I went to, Blue Mountain Academy, and he was graduating. So I thought, you know, I'm going to go out for the weekend and, you know, celebrate Jonathan, have a good time, see some old friends, yada, yada, yada. Well, something else happened there. See, God is funny. God is really funny. Something else happened. And God says, uh, yeah, you think you're going there for Jonathan, but you're really going there for you because I have something in store for you. Whenever I get there on Friday, an ex-girlfriend of mine, who also has her brother graduating that weekend, happens to be there. And this woman, young woman at the time, whenever we, we started talking, we hadn't seen each other for a couple of years, and we started kind of reminiscing a little bit, and we spent hours together on that Friday. But I said to her, I said, hey, tomorrow, I'm going to go see Cliffhanger with the guys. You want to come with me? Cliffhanger was a movie of Sylvester Stallone and, you know, because machismo, you know, so I had to be a machismo guy. And she looks at me and says, no. Okay. Well, I went to Cliffhanger on the Sabbath. I know I'm a bad boy. Okay. But came back afterwards, and we spent the rest of the evening with each other talking. The next morning, I couldn't wait to get up and go sit with this girl again and talk to her. After we were done, you know, the graduation, I think Jonathan and Jess graduated, I think. I don't really remember. 
You know, I got her phone number. She lived down near Philadelphia, and I lived on the opposite side of the state. And so we called each other. Literally, I got home that night, and I called her, and we talked, you know, Sunday night and Monday night and Tuesday night. And then I said to her, I said, hey, you know, I'd like to, like to see you. So she gives me directions. Huh. By the way, this girl don't ever get directions from. Use Google. You're going to be much better off. <laughs> okay. I end up lost in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I mean lost. Eventually, I find this group that's leaving out. They're leaving, and they say, hey, just follow us. And I said, okay, great. So I followed them out there, and I got down there. So I get down to her house, and it was, by the time I got there, with all the traffic and everything like that, by the time I got there, it was probably 9 o'clock at night. And so I'm sitting out in her driveway, and we're just ch- talking. She wouldn't let me in the house because she's one of those good Adventist girls, okay? She wouldn't let me in the house. About 11.30, her mother and father pull into the driveway. They see they had been at the Paul McCartney concert down in Philadelphia. And they pull into the driveway. And I see my, well, I see this man. I won't, yeah, he, he's eventually my future father-in-law. He looks at me like, who is this guy and why is he in my driveway? Get out and, Je- well, this girl, Jennifer, I'll just, it's Jennifer. You know, they start talking. And then my future mother-in-law says, well, obviously you're going to need a place to stay. So if you know anything about my mother-in-law, she's one of those ones that she's very, you know, you get her, she's like the Energizer Bunny. You wind her up and you get her on a task. It's going to get done. So she goes in the house and, and downstairs, what I later called the freezer, because they had this big honking window unit uh, uh, air conditioner that literally tried to freeze me out. She pulls out the, the, the uh, couch uh, bed thing, you know, those things that you never want to sleep in. We all know, right? You wake up and like, <clears throat> okay, get in there, okay? The next day, she's got to go to work. So I was like, okay, great. So I get up and I hear this place called Wawa. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, like a convenience store, gas station type thing. And I just kind of explore around. I get the newspaper and see that Jurassic Park had the biggest opening of all time. So after she gets off work, though, we go to Valley Forge National Park. And we spend the rest of the day. And it is a spect- it's, it's spectacular spectacular day. At the end of that day, we drive down a little bit further south on 202, go to Wilmington, and we, we eat at a TGI Fridays. And while we're eating there, Jennifer says, I got to use the restroom. And this Fridays had like a little balcony thing that was right up here, and so they were sitting right above us right there. And I'm sitting there eating, And the mother and the daughter, the daughter is in her teens and the mother's sitting there. The mother leans down over me and says, you're going to ask that girl to marry you, aren't you, son? I looked at her and I said, how did you know that? She says, it's all over your face. (laughs) I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. I can't wait to meet that woman again someday. So we go to Jurassic Park and I'm the ever the romantic Jurassic Park. Dinosaurs. What am I going to do? I'm going to ask somebody to marry me. I know. Isn't that right? I'm in my little green tempo. I put on my favorite Bon Jovi song, Bed of Roses. I wait for the guitar, a little, a real romantic part. I pull out this big nugget. I had this big gold nugget ring. That's what I had. And I said, Jennifer, will you marry me? And now, men, we know that moment, right? That moment, you're like, you had that split second, like, oh, it, 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 thank God it was only a split second. Immediately, she said yes. Why do I share this story? Because I think it's important that you understand something. See, see, we have all these trophies in our life, but God intentionally makes sure that there are people, that there are instances, that there are, there are things in your way that allow you to understand that you can always be pulled back to him. See, I needed Jennifer in my life for a lot of reasons. 
But you know what she really was for me? She was a compass. And she still is a compass for me. To this day, we have been married now. We've been married almost, oh my goodness, it'll be one month, it'll be 29 years. 29 years. Yeah, we got married six weeks later, by the way. Huh? Six weeks, I said weeks. Weeks later, not months, weeks later. Yeah, most people would have said, oh, months, that's nothing, but it was six weeks later. See, see, what Jennifer did for me is she kind of helped me kind of go back true north. And so she had already had a job lined up down in College, College Dale, Tennessee, so we moved down there. Southern Adventist University changed my life forever. I will forever espouse the virtues of Southern Adventist University. I went back to school there, and I interfaced with people that I knew walked with Jesus. And that their compass was focused a certain direction. And that their trophies were laid down. And that they cared about one thing. And that's the old rugged cross where Jesus Christ laid everything on the line for us. And that meant something. I remember waking up in the morning. I'd have to get up because I took classes in the morning in the afternoon that summer. And I'd get up super early. And I'd walk through this thing called the Garden of Prayer. If any of you guys know Southern's campus, it's near the religion building. And it was just like this. It was like the best 30 seconds of my day. I'd walk through it. And it was always so tranquil and awesome. But it was so important for me to have that in my life. It was so important for God to be able to say, son, I've got you. I'm taking care of it. And I got three minutes. I'm going to try to wrap this up in three minutes. So give me three minutes. Son, I've got you under control here. You just have to trust me. And what is interesting about that is that whenever I went all in, God is taking care of everything. Now, has my life been a, just a bowl of peaches all the time? No. Has any of your lives been that way? No. But you know, whenever I've had the hardest times, whenever my brother David committed suicide, whenever my brother Matthew overdosed, well, in those times that, that was, I was in the deepest despair, I would sing Amazing Grace, or I would sing Old Rugged Cross, or I would, I would think about Jesus, and he always walked me through it every single time because I then understood that the trophies I was having in my life could not fill that void. Having all the money in the world is not going to change the fact that my brother was dead. But having Jesus Christ talking to me and easing my heart made all the difference in the world. What trophies do you have, ladies and gentlemen? What is it that people are looking at whenever they see you and say, eh, you're a fake. And in today's world, people see fakes quicker than ever. What is it that you are holding on to that is not allowing people to see who you truly, if you really mean it, who you truly are? We've got to lay down our trophies, whether that's money or, or status or I don't care what it is. It could be a, a, a billion things. But there's things in your life that you're allowing to interfere with your relationship with God. Ask yourself, what is it? And why is it that you're holding on to that? And what does God have to do for you that will allow you to come fully into his arms? So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to that old rugged cross, and this is the best part, people, and exchange it one day for a crown. Thank you so much. Thanks, for Rick, for that wonderful message. Let's stand as we sing the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of 
suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised and above to tear it to dark Calvary. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then you'll call me someday to my home far away where glory forever I'll share. So I'll cheer, cheer to the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross to exchange it someday for a crown. What page? So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Dear God, I just ask that you help us to remember the meaning of the old rugged cross, the meaning of Jesus Christ hanging on that tree for our sins and our transgressions, being laid in that grave and to rising again so we can be free, free of sin and free of eternal death. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for that gift. Watch over each and every person here today. Bless, guide, lead, and protect us always. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we all said, amen. amen.